been to Paris, you probably remember the specific moment that you first spotted the Eiffel Tower. Maybe it was on the window of your plane, maybe like me, it was peeking over the buildings from the Jardin de Tuileries. But when you saw it, it probably gave you chills. Chills that said, I'm really here, I'm really in Paris. Even if you hadn't been to Paris, you likely still recognize the Eiffel Tower immediately whenever you see it in print and film. It's the emblem of Paris and of France, and it's almost universally recognized. This summer, I had the amazingly good fortune to find myself standing in front of the Eiffel Tower with my family. Now, I'm not normally one to foist vacation photos on a room full of strangers, but this picture my wife took of my seven-year-old son is one of my favorite pictures in the whole world. We just finished a picnic on the champs de -Mont, and my son pulled out his trip notebook, and he started to sketch. And you can see just how captivated he is by the tower, how hard he's working to capture it accurately. And the Eiffel Tower does this to you. It pulls you in. makes you pay attention. Now, I know a little bit of the history of the tower already, but as I sat there watching my son draw, I found myself thinking about the circumstances that brought the tower into existence. When it was completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower, at 1,000 feet tall, became the tallest structure in the world, almost doubling the height of the just completed Washington Monument. Now, how did Gustave Eiffel build something so tall using late 1800s technology? Why build such an ostentatious statement piece in the first place? Well, to explain that, I have to tell you a little bit about French history. Just a little bit, I promise. This is Napoleon III. He is the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was elected as the president of France under a Republican government in 1848. But at the end of his four years, he decided that this whole Republican thing wasn't very convenient for him. He did not want to leave the job president, so he threw himself a coup and decided to declare himself the emperor and make France an empire again. Now, normally the French people, you'd expect them to revolt and to react against this, but in the four years that Bonaparte had been the president of France, he had guided France into such a period of prosperity that the people just couldn't be bothered to revolt. They decided that uh, this, may, this might be okay. That prosperity, however, ended with the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Napoleon picked a fight with Prussia, one of the states of modern-day Germany to the north, to counter their growing influence and power in the region. He got off a little bit more than he could chew, though, and he was captured in a massive defeat in the Battle of Sedan on September 4, 1870. You can see our friend Napoleon here handing over his sword in humiliation after losing the battle. It was an embarrassment for him and an embarrassment for France. Now, for the capture of Napoleon, the French set up a new Republican government, and its first job was to get the Prussians to go home rather than annex the, north, the whole northern part of France. And to do that, the government had to pay massive reparations to the Prussian government that plunged France deep into debt. Prosperity was gone, and not only was France broke, but their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War was a huge blow to the collective French ego. By the early 1880s, about 10 years later, France was nearly back on its feet. It had largely recovered from the defeat and subsequent reparations from the war, and the Republican government enacted after the end of Napoleon III's empire had held its own against plenty of challenges and was guiding France back in prosperity. On top of that, the 30-year renovation of Paris by Georges-Jean Hosselin, replacing narrow medieval streets with these broad tree-lined avenues like most of us are familiar with in Paris, was nearing completion. The Parisians were ready to show off. And what better way to do that than to put on another World's Fair? Across the English Channel, Prince Albert, that was one of Britain's Queen Victoria, had the idea in 1851 to invite all the nations of the world to come to London and show off their industrial progress. Well, the French liked this idea so well that they threw another own four years later in 1855. And then again in 1867. And then again in 1878. This time eight years after Napoleon's defeat in the Battle of Sedan. The 1878 exposition was meant to mark the French recovery from the Franco-Prussian War, but the French were so embroiled in political turmoil that they didn't begin preparing for the exhibition until about six months before. It was a bit of a shambles. It didn't really do a good job of showing off France. And so, in the early 1880s, a movement to host yet another World's Fair in Paris was picking up steam. An organizing committee was formed to start making preparations, and the first thing they did was to pick a date. And what better date than the 100th anniversary of the storming of the Bastille? Now, the Storming of the Bastille was the symbolic start of the French Revolution, the overthrow of the French monarchy. And it's still celebrated every year in France today as Bastille Day, much like we celebrate Independence Day here. 
Each of the exhibitions held in Paris had been more grandiose than the last. And so the committee had also decided that they needed something really special, something to kick this exhibition up a notch. They announced a design competition to design and build a spectacular centerpiece monument for this exhibition. Well, this competition got the attention of these two gentlemen, Maurice Coquelin and Emile Nouguier. Two structural engineers at La Compagnie de Atabismont de Fell. Now, the two of them had just finished working together on this, the Vigervi Viaduct. At 407 feet above the tree or river below it, it was the highest bridge in the world when it opened in 1884. And they had the idea of using the same engineering principles to build a giant tower as a centerpiece for the exhibition. And so they got to work. And this sketch by Coquelin is what they came up with. You can see here on the, the margin on the right, there's a sketch of the Notre Dame, the Statue of Liberty, the Arc de Triomphe. They were proposing to build a gargantuan tower, 300 meters tall, 1,000 feet, the tallest structure in the world. Coquelin and Nouguier excitedly took the sketch to their boss to pitch the idea. And as you may have guessed from the company name, their boss was none other than Gustave Eiffel. Eiffel had been a bit lukewarm on this whole competition. His firm had just finished the Garibay Viaduct after all, and he was looking forward to a break, not another massive project. And on top of that, his country kept spending money on these grand exhibitions. They'd build all these beautiful buildings, spend a ton of money, and then at the end, they'd just tear them all down. He felt like to build things of significance. He wanted to build things that would last. The design competition had a requirement that the centerpiece monument be easy to disassemble. And this was a complete non-starter for Eiffel. Coquelin and Nouguier had hoped that the grandiose of their idea would be enough to change Eiffel's mind and get him on their side, but it just wasn't enough. And so they got this guy involved, Stephen Sovest. Sovest was Eiffel's chief architect, and he really knew his boss's taste really well. And so he suggested several modifications to the design to make it more useful and aesthetically pleasing. If you look carefully at Coquelin's drawing, you can see the modifications Sovest sketched in the pencil. There's a glass observation put in on the first deck, and at the very top, there's a couple of them, containing another observation deck and capped by a French flag. In the final design, you can see the three observation decks as well as the lace-like decorative arches that were suggested by Sylvester. Now this, this guy felt excited. This tower had purpose now. People could view all of Paris from heights previously reserved for balloonists. It would be possible to do weather observations and even to make radio transmissions from such a high point. And so he bought the patent for the design from Coquelin, Nouguier and Sylvester, and began the hard work of getting the design selected. The idea was immediately popular with the French public, who loved the idea of dwarfing the just completed Washington line and investing the upstart Marians. It was not, however, immediately popular with the architects, artists, and most important, politicians around Paris. And so Eiffel went on the offensive. This was his first writing on the subject, and if any of you speak French, I do apologize. The tour on fire du 300 mètres sur le destiné de l'exposition de 18 which roughly translates to 300 meter high iron tower for the 1889 exhibition. This particular copy, which sold at auction in 2015 for just shy of $10,000, was autographed to General Georges Boulanger, a prominent politician who would go on to be the French war minister. But he felt he was giving copies to literally anybody that would give him an audience. He also went before the Société d'Ingénieurs Civils, the Society of Civil Engineers, to present his idea and stand for questioning, and oh, were they happy to watch. One of Eiffel's chief critics was Paul Planat, the founder and editor of the architectural journal La Construction Monnier. Planat was not impressed with Eiffel's design, and felt it was counter to the hard work that Haussmann had just done to beautify Paris in the Great Renovation. Specifically, in the May 1st, 1886 issue of his journal, he said, Eiffel's tower is nothing more than an inartistic scaffolding of crossbars and angled iron. It looks hideously unfinished. Pierre Girard, a powerful politician who would go on to become the French Prime Minister, decried it as anti-artistic, contrary to French genius. It's a project more in character with America, where taste is not yet very developed, than Europe, much less France. But probably the most famous protest against the tower was led by this man, Charles Garnier, a prominent French architect. He formed the Committee of the 300, one member for each meter of proposed height of the tower, and it was made up of some of the most prominent figures in the arts and architecture in Paris. Their protest, published in the prominent Parisian paper at Tom, said in part, imagine for a moment a giddy, ridiculous tower dominating Paris like a giant black smokestack, crushing under its barbaric oak, Notre Dame, the Tour Saint-Jacques, the 
the Louvre, the Dome of the Invalides, the Arc de Triomphe, all of our humiliated monuments will disappear in this ghastly dream. Kanye mean, had a flair for dramatic. But it was around this time that Edouard LaCroix was named Minister of Trade and put in charge of wrapping up the design competition. He had been among those that he felt had lobbied with his design. And despite the protests of the artist, he and the rest of the political class quite liked Eiffel's design. He liked it so much that in calling for the final proposals, LaCroix amended the competition guidelines to call for a tower of at least 300 meters in height and suggest that it might be built out of iron. It's an obvious not to have felt design. Now, some of the other entrants in included a 300 meter tall lighthouse to display the enlightenment of Paris. It was built of granite, and it would have been far too heavy to ever build, but that was the idea. A 300 meter tall water sprinkler, in case Paris ever plunged into debt and a drought, so they could water all of these beautiful gardens that, that uh, Hossman had just installed in Paris. My favorite, a 300 meter tall guillotine, <laughs> to honor the French Revolution. And after all, it is the 100th anniversary, what better way to honor it? But in the end, he fell to sign was the only one that was practical or even possible to build. And so on June 12, 1886, LaCroix gave an overjoyed he felt the news that his design had been selected. The joy was short-lived, however, as the government bought and he fell's estimate of six million francs, around one million US, for building the tower. The government had initially committed to fund the full tower for whoever won this competition, but they quickly backtracked their offer to 1.5 million francs, about a quarter of what he felt thought it was gonna cost to get the tower built. And so Eiffel was going to have to secure investors for the remaining four and a half million francs. And to do that, he needed to be able to make money from this town. And so he requested two provisions from the French government. Number one, he requested that he be able to charge admission of, over and above the cost that people were already paying to attend the exhibition. And second, he asked that the tower be allowed to stand for 20 years, not the one year it was originally slated to stand for. So we have time to make his money back. The government agreed in principle to this, but this created another interesting problem. The exhibition was to be held in the Champ de Mans in the 7th arrondissement just south of the Seine River. The Champ de Mans was the French Army's primary drilling ground. Now, he felt that proposed to put his thousand foot tower right here in the middle of the Champ de Mans. The Army was already resigned to losing their drilling ground for the year that it would take to host the exhibition. This happened every time the French politicians got this wild hair and decided to do one of these things. But having a giant tower in the middle of their primary drilling ground for 19 years after the end of the exhibition, that just wouldn't do. And so after much negotiating, it was agreed that the tower would instead be located here, in the northwest portion of the Champ de near the bank of the Seine, leaving most of the field open for military drilling once the rest of the exhibition was dismantled. Now, Eiffel knew that this would complicate the foundation, but he had little choice but to compromise if he wanted to get his tower built. French bureaucracy being what it was, it took six anxious months for the contract to be finalized and the funding put in place. But finally, on January 8, 1887, Eiffel had a signed contract in his hand. He immediately began gathering supplies and hiring workers, and then on January 28, 1887, Eiffel's workers began work on the foundation. They had a little over two years until the planned opening of the exhibition to get this tower built. Now, I mentioned that moving the tower closer to the Seine complicated the foundation work, and here's what I mean by that. Each leg of the tower rests on four six and a half foot thick slabs of concrete, one for each of the principal girders of those legs. The east and south legs of the tower rested on solid ground on the Champ de Mars side of the site. The west and north legs, though, were far more complicated because they were on the side of the site closest to the Seine, and the ground here was made of millions of years of sediment deposit from the river, much, much less stable. So for those two legs, each of the four slabs required two piles to be driven 72 feet down into the ground to hit that rock. Not only that, the six and a half foot foundations actually had to be poured below the water table of the Seine. You can't pour concrete when there's water. And so this is what Eiffel's team did to cope with that. You can see these giant iron structures. These are 50 by 20 foot cast iron caissons. What they did is filled these with pressurized air, and men would work in this pressurized environment, digging out the soil, the caissons would slowly sink into the ground with the pressurized air, keeping water from infiltrating the construction site until they finally got it dug as deep as they needed to be and they were able to pour the concrete foundations. It took a while, but it was effective. Five months later, on June 30th, 1887, the foundations were finally finished. 
This is what the foundation for each of the four legs look like when it's completed. There are four, four sets of these foundations. Each foundation can have two bolts embedded into it to bolt the shoe of the primary inverter. The bolts look kind of small in this picture, but to give you context, each of those bolts is about four inches in diameter and 25 feet long. So pretty big. And as soon as the foundations were complete, Eiffel's team immediately began the iron work. You can see here in this picture how the primary girders attach at an angle to the foundations, and the reason for this is twofold. Number one, they were building on shaky ground, and, and attaching at an angle let them spread the load out both vertically and horizontally. So it would push effectively at an angle instead of going straight down into this wet, soggy ground. But also, this was going to be the tallest thing anybody had ever built, and there was going to be tremendous wind acting on it a thousand feet in the air. Nobody ever built anything that had to stand up to wind a thousand feet in the air. And so the angle of the legs gave the tower more stability against that wind. Work on the ironwork progressed quickly in large part due to the precision of the drawings produced by Eiffel's office. In all, they made 1,700 general drawings of the tower and a further 3,629 drawings of specific parts and pieces that they needed. Now, to give you an idea of how precise these, these drawings were, each of the rivet holes on these drawings were calculated down to the tenth of a millimeter. Each of the angles was calculated down to one second of an arc, which is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. Incredibly precise. These precisely drawn parts were then forged and drilled in a Fels pack factory in Le Walter Ray on the outskirts of Paris, and then brought to the site via horse-drawn carriage. Henry Ford wouldn't invent his Model T for another few decades. Early in 1888, they had reached a critical juncture in the first phase of construction. Because the rest of the tower would rise from the first platform, it was absolutely critical that the four legs of the tower be level at the first platform. The tower was so tall that a few millimeters out of true here could result in a difference of more than a foot at the top of the tower. And Phil's plan for dealing with this was actually really ingenious. You can't see it in this picture. They built these legs at a slightly steeper angle than they needed them to be. A centimeter or two, very slightly steeper. And the legs of the tower aren't actually resting on the scaffold. You can't see it, but there's actually a set of sandboxes between the scaffolding and the ironwork. And the reason they did this was to allow for millimeter precise adjustments at the angle of those legs. When they wanted to adjust the leg, they would take the cork out of the bottom of the sandbox, let some sand run out until it lowered enough, and put the cork back in. And they repeated this process over and over again until they got all four legs of the tower exactly where they wanted them, perfectly level. Once they did that, all they had to do was join them together with the platform to lock them in place. And so on March 20th, 1888, the first and most complicated portion of the tower was completed. They still had 800 feet to go, though, and only a year to do it. Another problem that, excuse me, another problem they faced is that as they built up from the first level, it became increasingly complicated to get the parts they needed up to where they were actually doing the work. And to solve this, they used the first platform of the tower as, this, as a staging area. A large steam crank, again, internal combustion engines would come into common use for a few decades. A large steam crank would lift parts from the ground up to the first level. On the first level, they had built a small railroad to move these heavy iron parts around to the, the actual girder of the tower that they were going to go up. And then on each girder of the tower, mounted to the elevator tracks, was a smaller steam crank, which you can see one in, in the picture here. These cranes would move up the tower as it was built, and they would pick the parts up from the first level platform up to the area where the work was actually taking place and parts were being attached to the tower. By July, the tower was complete up to the second level. And if you look at the background here, you can start to see some other buildings for the exhibition starting to take place, starting to take form. The exhibition was stated to start, slated to start in eight months, and they still had 600 feet to go in eight months. Long way to go. Another issue Eiffel's team had to solve was how to rivet pieces together so far off the ground. The Eiffel Tower was assembled almost entirely by riveting. The prefabricated parts were brought to the tower, hauled up, put into place, and test fit. And once the crew were certain they had the assembly right, they would begin the tedious process of driving rivets through all of the precisely aligned holes. The problem is that before driving the rivets, they had to be heated up to red hot. Now, the way this would be normally handled on a construction site in the 1800s is there would be a forge somewhere on site, and there would be a rivet boy that would run with a tin pail full of red-hot rivets to wherever construction was taking place. Well, if they tried to do that here, the rivets would be cold by the time they got them up the tower. And so instead, they used portable forges. And you can see the worker using one here in the foreground. This worker in the foreground is heating up the rivets. And if you 
you've ever seen a rivet, it's essentially a screw with no threads. It's got a head on one end, and it's just a straight steel or iron shaft. So it heats it up to red hot, and they insert it through the two pieces to be joined. The guy in the back is holding the rivet by the head. Then on the front, there's a worker on the left here who's holding a tool to shape another head in the rivet, and a worker hitting that tool with a hammer. And the two of them together shape a head on the other side of the rivet. The beauty of this process is that as this red hot rivet cools, it expands. And it, it creates an incredibly tight joint in the two pieces that it's joining together. The problem is they had to do this two and a half million times because there are two and a half million rivets holding the Eiffel Tower together. At the peak of construction, there were 24 man crews, just like this one, working all over the tower. And these little portable forges would go with them all the way to the very top of the tower, a thousand feet. With all the really complicated stuff behind them, other than just sheer height, the top part of the tower actually went up quite smoothly. They added about 100 feet each month until they topped the tower out on March 15, 1889. When the tower was structurally complete, well ahead of the exposition's opening, he felt marked for the occasion by inviting 15 reporters and Parisian dignitaries to scale the 1,710 steps to the top of him to raise the French flag up top. He fell, who you can see in the center here, said to have remarked at the time, gentlemen, the French flag is the only flag in the world with a 300 meter tall flagpole. Now, the reason they had to climb the stairs is because the elevators were not yet ready. This might have had something to do with the fact that they were the most complex passenger elevators ever built. I don't have time to get into them right now, but if you want to hear more about that, ask me later. It's a fascinating story. Despite the fact that the first 30,000 visitors to the tower, including Monsieur Eiffel here on the left, had to climb 1,700 steps to get to the top. The tower was a huge success. Eiffel was figuratively and literally on top of the world. When it was completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower at 1,063 feet tall was the tallest structure on Earth, more than 500 feet taller than the previous record holder, the Washington Monument. That's approximately equivalent, approximately equal to an 81-story building. The Eiffel Tower would actually hold this record until the topping out of the Chrysler Building in New York 41 years later. No structure built after the Eiffel Tower has held that record for longer. <coughs> it's a remarkable achievement that broke all kinds of new ground. And it's the kind of work that we all say we want to be doing, right? We want to push the envelope, solve hard problems that no one else has solved, ship amazing software. So what can we learn from Gustav Eiffel to help us do that? Well, to start, I'm going to ask for a little audience participation. I want to try something. I'm going to put a word up on the screen. And I want you, without thinking about it, to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down to show your general feelings about the subject. All right? Everybody get your thumbs ready? All right. Here's your word. Lots of thumbs down. A few thumbs up. Lots of thumbs down. Exactly what I would expect. And I'm glad, too, because I don't know what we would do with the rest of our time together if you'd all been like, yay, I love politics, it's my favorite. <laughs> Most of us would prefer just to keep our heads down and ship code, right? <clears throat> A study published in the Wall Street Journal back in 2011 asked participants about their approach to office politics, giving them these three options. Number one, it's best to know what's going on, but not to participate directly. Number two, it's best to stay out of office politics completely. Or number three, it's best to participate so you can get ahead. Now, how do you think people answered? Well, between the group that wanted to stay informed but not participate, and the group that stayed out of politics altogether, fully 83% of participants picked an answer saying they did not participate in office politics. So you're not alone. I bet some of us even have even left jobs because our companies were too political. I know I have. But here's the thing, and it took me way too long to come to terms with this. Every organization is political. You can't escape politics by just moving around enough until you find the right boss or the right company. And the reason for that is that anytime you have more than one person working on something together, you'll have politics. Because politics is nothing more than how humans share power and make decisions together. That means that doing anything meaningful in your company whether it's as simple as getting to work on something you want to work on, or as complex as completely overhauling your hiring practices to increase diversity and representation, requires you to understand and participate in the politics of your company. I know. Thanks, Nick. 
what an uplifting and positive message to end our day on. But stay with me. Politics doesn't have to be negative and gross. There's a couple things Ethel does that gives us a great example to follow on how to do politics the right way. Let's rewind back to the work Ethel did before the tower was built. Remember this paper that Ethel put together to promote his plan for the tower? He went around from official to official, handing out autographed copies and talking about what he wanted to build. What he felt was doing here was actually pretty simple. He was just networking and doing a bit of self-promotion. Now again, how many of you love networking and self-promotion? These, these are some of my favorite things too. <laughs> but they're kind of like politics. They, they get a bit of a bad rap that they don't entirely deserve. So let me reframe them for you. Networking and self-promotion is really nothing more than making friends and telling stories. That's all it is. A little less intimidating, right? But that's all he fellows do. He would invite somebody out for lunch, or more likely to spend an afternoon on the terrace of a Parisian cafe, polishing off a bottle of wine together, and he'd tell stories. He'd regale them with tales of building the Garrity Viaduct. He might even tell them that when a train passed, the bridge was displaced by precisely eight millimeters, exactly as his mathematical models had predicted before construction ever started. Cool story. Then he'd show them the final drawing of the tower, and maybe talk about how amazing it would be when a tower on French soil past the height of the great obelisk the Americans have been working on, off and on for 40 years. He'd listen to their stories too, and by the end of the conversation, he'd made a friend. Now importantly, he didn't just do this with people on the exposition committee. The fact that this document is autographed in George Belanger tells us that. Belanger was in the government and didn't want to be war minister, but he had absolutely nothing to do with the exposition committee. He had no decision-making power whatsoever in this design competition. That's what networking is all about. It's just making friends. Maybe you'll be in a position to help each other at some point, but that's not the immediate focus. So what does that mean for you? Well, maybe you should grab coffee with your product manager. So they're a human to you, not just somebody who drops things on the top of your backlog and asks for ridiculous, unrealistic dates. Maybe you should get lunch with somebody in sales, because they're the ones hearing the questions your customers are asking. And they have no clue how you do what you do, and they would love to hear. The second part, self-promotion, is about making sure others know what you've been working on and telling stories. Not in a braggy way, in an informative way. Now, in a perfect world, doing good work would be enough. But we don't live in a perfect world. Your manager isn't paying nearly as much attention to you as you think they are. So you have to tell them what you've been up to. You have to show them the work that you've been doing. Show them what you've been working on and what you've accomplished is a big part of how you build your reputation at work with your manager and with other folks elsewhere in the organizations you work in. If you want a promotion, or you want to build more influence so you can affect big changes, this is a big part of how you do it, building this influence. If you want something to help you, something to help you learn to do this more effectively, I can't recommend Dale Carnegie's classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People, highly enough. It's full of timeless advice on how to do this well, and in a productive and non-scummy way that benefits you and the person you're talking to. But the other thing Ephel has to teach us, let's go back to the contract he signed on January 28, 1887. Now, if you remember, the French government had initially proposed to cover the entire cost of the tower. But at the last minute, they balked and only agreed to cover a quarter of the cost. Now, at this point, it would have been really easy for Ephel to play hardball and demand the government live up to its original proposal, or he would walk away. Remember, he didn't really want to build this tower in the first place. He had to be talked into it. But that's not what he did. Instead, he did a bit of negotiation. Now, again, another one of our favorite words. This probably makes you think of buying a used car and trying not to get screwed. So let me reframe it too. Good negotiation is really all about cooperation. Working together to find an outcome that works for everyone. Now, Eiffel understood the French government's position. And he had empathy for the government representatives he was talking to. Putting on an exposition is expensive. And they, frankly, didn't have the six million francs to give them. So instead of walking away, he worked with them to find a way to satisfy his need for six million francs and their need to not give them six million francs and only give them a million and a half instead. And he found that mutually beneficial solution in being able to charge admission for 20 years. As an aside, that turned out to be a phenomenal deal for Eiffel. An amazing 1.8 million people ascended the tower during the exhibition, paying on average three francs apiece for the privilege of doing so. So the tower had more than paid for itself by the end of the exhibition, and he had another 19 years to profit from it. 
Now, when we're fighting for something we want, there's a temptation to see that process as a zero-sum game. Someone has to win, and someone has to lose. If only needed six million francs to build a tower, so it was that or bust. Your executive team wants a piece of functionality delivered by an absurd, impossible date, so you need to tell them in no uncertain terms that there's no way your team can do that. The reality, there's almost always a middle ground where everyone gets most of what they want. The trick is figuring out what it actually is that everyone in the situation wants and why they want it. That's often not obvious. It requires you to exercise empathy and compassion and to ask deep, probing, open-ended questions to let you build understanding. So when your executive team starts pushing for that unrealistic date, try to understand why. Look to see if there's a smaller piece of it that you can deliver early that will meet whatever in media is driving that push. If you want to learn to do this well, grab a copy of Herb Cohen's classic, You Can Negotiate Anything. Now the title's a little cheesy, but this book changed the course of my career when one of my mentors recommended it to me years ago. Cohen teaches a style of negotiation that revolves around understanding everyone's needs, especially your own, that's one of the hardest parts, and getting to agreement by finding mutually beneficial ways to fulfill them. But what about bad politics? Are there organizations and bosses that are over overly political? Absolutely there are. And if you find yourself in an organization that regularly promotes those that play the game instead of those that do good work, you might need to leave. Or if you find yourself working for a boss that always takes credit for your good work, there might not be enough networking and self-promotion for you to get around that. But if Gustave Eiffel didn't find the French government too political to navigate and negotiate with, there's a good chance that bar is higher than you think it is, and you just need to push against your own discomfort. There's another level you should consider here as well. Everything I've, I've shared so far has been for us as individual contributors, as developers. But some of us in this room are managers or team leads. What does this have to do with how we lead our teams? Well, the conventional wisdom around organizational politics for tuning in leaders who care about their teams is this. Now, I try not to use profanity on stage, but this is such a common term in our industry that I'm not sure saying shit umbrella even counts as saying a bad word. But that's the common wisdom around politics and leadership. You might have to engage in organizational politics to get your job done, but you should shield your teams from politics, which Jason Free calls bullshit here, so they can keep their heads down and stay productive. Now, there is some truth to this. Constant disruption and getting jerked around from priority to priority are counterproductive for your team. And helping them stay heads down and writing code eight hours a day is going to feel really productive to them and to you too. But the full reality is actually more nuanced. The downside of being in a previous shit umbrella is that you become a choke point of information for your team. Over time, you'll disconnect your team from the mission of your organization entirely. And since we know that a sense of purpose is an important motivator for most humans, that disconnection quickly leads to dissatisfaction and even leading the company. On top of that, you're not designed to bear that load. Putting yourself in that spot as a leader is all but guaranteed to burn you out. So what should we do instead? Well, one of the engineers on my team, Steve Rickard, introduced me to an analogy that I like a lot better than the umbrella. Heat shield. We get the term heat shield from the world of space travel and orbital reentry. Unlike an umbrella, a heat shield is not designed to be impervious. An umbrella blocks all the rain that hits it, but a heat shield blocks just enough heat to make reentry survivable. That's it. It's a carefully calculated compromise. If it blocked all heat, the spacecraft would be too heavy to reach orbit in the first place. Not enough, and reentry's not survival, the craft burns up on the way back in. If you lead a team, this carefully crafted balance is your job. You need to block enough organizational noise so that your team has consistent direction and big blocks of time to work, but not so much that they lose context and connection. Blocking all the noise might make them feel more comfortable, but it will ultimately keep them from delivering the value that they're capable of. It'll also stunt their career growth because, as I said earlier, sorry, I lost my slide. As I said earlier, all organizations are political. If the folks on your team are never exposed to organizational politics, they'll never learn how to deal with organizational politics. They'll never learn how to be as effective as they can by working the power, patterns of power in your organization. So, what happened to the Eiffel Tower? It's obviously still here. Well, at the end of the 20 years, it fell out of the promise. The tower was too much a part of Paris's global identity to do anything but leave it right where it stood. 
The Phelps Tower is still standing 129 years later. And while it hasn't been the tallest structure on the planet for a while, it remains the most visited paid monument in the world, with nearly 7 million visitors every year waiting in line for hours to take in the breathtaking views of Paris it provides. Had you found not been willing to participate in the politics involved, you wouldn't have the Eiffel Tower. The same is true for you. You can choose to keep your head down and hop from job to job every time you get a whiff of politics. That's a valid choice. But doing that is eventually going to stunt your career. Even if you want to stay on the individual contributor track and become a senior technical contributor in your organization, you'll need to understand politics to develop the influence that you need to drive technical decisions. If, instead of running, you accept that politics is a reality, neither good nor bad in and of itself, and you learn to participate in organizational politics in a way that remains true to you and to the things that you value, you can find ways to have a huge impact in your organization and maybe even the world. If you're a leader, you can help your teams have the same impact by helping them learn how to navigate politics as well. It may seem intimidating, but you can do it. I know you can. Good luck. Uh, Marty's talking, we're talking uh, in a bit, and Katrina's also like, talking about this idea of trade-offs and solutions not necessarily being like right or wrong without context. Um, it's interesting, I think as you're hitting here at the end, one of the patterns, uh, I'm going to presume you've observed this over the last 10 or 15 years also, is that there are friends in the industry who kind of came up in what I will call our generation and got into this world in 2003, five, seven, nine, and now after 10 or 12 or 15 years, have done, have been at several places, have been around two years here, one year there, two years there. And you see in the end, typically, a dissatisfaction. I think there is a danger for people as they amass a good of experience uh, and, and get maybe a little bit of reputation, then out all of a sudden everyone wants to be your friend. Right? Every company wants to hire you. For you specifically, if we're like, oh no, get up, it's over. We need a new job for Nick. Right? Tomorrow, possibly, by next Friday, we would have a great job. Right, we would find out I would find a job for you. Yeah. You know, even a person like you. Um, <laughs> but how do you know? How do you know when it's time or when the like situation is such that I, I can't or shouldn't do it? Like if I take the message of get in, like play the game, fight the battle, make the change, how do I split between, or how do I differentiate between the situation that's worth it and the situation that's not? It's a great question. I it was a very long, long question. Yeah. Okay. You're good. It's a good one, though. It's a good one. And it's it's difficult to know. And I think those signals are different for everybody. This is good. Yeah, because I can turn that off. Why don't I do that? It's a little, it is a little flashy. Now I'm going to use the touch bar for something. Nobody do that very often. That was cool. Um, so I think I think this signal is different for everybody. For me, one of the things I've always looked for about when is it time for me to go is, do I feel like I've learned everything that I can learn here in this position? Everything or like 95%? No, that's 95% of that, yeah. Uh, enough that I'm hitting the point of diminishing returns. There's not much left that I'm going to learn in the position I'm in, and I don't have a great roadmap to get to the next position to stretch myself even further. Um, as a leader, the other thing I look for is when it gets to the point that I can no longer be an effective heat shield, I can no longer make a positive difference in the organization and create an environment where the team that I'm leading can thrive, that's another sign for me that it's, it's time for me to go. Um, the challenge there is, is not trying to be the hero. Because you can't do the thing where you become the show villain, you take on the organizational load, and you try to block everything and make it a sane environment working for you even when you're dealing with all sorts of things over your head and I've put myself in that position several times in my career and every time I've done it it's led to burnout which is what led to that section of the talk. Why, like why burnout? Is burnout 
just um, it is burnout fatigue or like what makes what's the difference between like working hard and getting burned out? Emotionally drained, putting give, giving so much of yourself to your job that you have nothing left to give to things outside of work. So when I notice that my job, I mean everybody's job has like goes in waves, right? So there's going to be peaks where your work life is going to spill over into your family life or your life with your friends or whatever. There's going to be times that that happens. But if you get to the point where you're hitting an asymptote and you're, you're right at the top of the graph and you're always coming home a stressed out wreck and taking your frustrated out on your family and, and whatnot, that's when you're hitting burnout. You've hit your max capacity. You don't have any more load that you can carry. One of the things that's been really interesting to me in a, in a company that's grown from one or two or three to now like 32 is to see that the organization can change out from under you in a way, right? That there are, is, is it your experience that there are people better suited to a small, uncertain, fast moving thing and uh, better suited to a slightly slower but like safer large thing and how do I figure out what kind of person I am? I don't know, what kind, of, what kind of person are you, Chad? That's a good question. That's what I've been looking for all day. <laughs> all these tips. Um, I don't know. I, I, in some ways, I think it's unfair to call large safe, because inevitably in a large organization, Microsoft can just come acquire you at any time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, in a large organization, it, it does take, it, it takes more work to get anything done, because there is inertia that you have to there's politics that you have to deal with. And people have varying capacities and appetites for dealing with that stuff. Like, I, I like, at, at GitHub, one of the things I've enjoyed so much so far is shipping software at the scale that we get to ship software. But you don't generally get to do that in a small company. So you have to pick the set of trade offs that are right for you at that point in your career. And it's going to vary over the course of your career. It's not, it's not a static answer for anybody. I've done plenty of time in startups too, and I love inventing the entire company out of thin air. And, you know, I also love having a legal team to go to when I have a question to ask and not having to scrounge around and pay hourly to do that. How do you know when you have been in those leadership positions, when, how do you recognize when you are the, uh, the fire cannon or the shit hose, like that now other people have to uh, defend against? Like how do you, or how do you try and avoid being? I'll go with fire, fire, fire. Cannon. <laughs> how do you avoid being the fire cannon to other people's heat shield? You have to build enough rapport and, and uh, relationships with people that they'll tell you. You have to have checks and friendly relationships in the organization where, when you do get to that point when you are being overbearing, that they will give you some corrective guidance and help you steer back. Same thing when you're starting to get frustrated and you're starting to tune out. You need the signal then at the same the same way. I'm going to tell you, hey, you're. I, I can tell you're getting tired here. Maybe you should take a few days. I think those are opposite sides of the same fluctuation. I don't have a better answer than that. Do you? Um, I think a warning sign for me is when uh, people don't hear you. When like the words you say are like listened to but not heard, yeah, and that's and that shows me that there's like a there's a disconnect, right, of the reality you perceive and the reality they pre perceive. Not saying that like yours is worse and theirs is better, or theirs that is worse and yours is better, or whatever. But when that's like a sign of the of the relationship getting stretched. Sure. And I think to your point about like Dale Carnegie and all these kinds of things. When we when I, when I talk to people about getting jobs, being in jobs, I think is like Marty said. There's a lot of similarities to parenthood. There's similarities to like partnerships and dating and all those. That, you know, I, I was just talking with somebody um, who has a job and they want a new one, and I said like, don't quit the one you've got. One like nobody wants to date a single person. But when you got somebody, you're like, hey, you must be half decent if someone is willing to talk to you, right? Uh, so takeaway tip for you, don't quit your job until you have a new one. 
And the bad side there, you're like, what if they find out I'm trying to get a new job? You were going to quit anyway. So, good. Uh, I can't remember how I got that. Totally that personal relationship. It's the same. It's the same patterns, right? It's the same patterns that make for like effective life partnerships, yeah. make for effective work partnerships, right? And I think that's. Uh, I think you made a good point of that doesn't always feel comfortable. Like, why should I have to do this? Right. You know. Well, that was me for a long time. I I, I lived the first decade of my career like thinking politics was toxic and I needed to find an organization that wasn't political and I'm finally happy when I found that organization. And my career changed dramatically when I figured out that there was no such thing. Yeah. The way it comes up for us with, with teaching people is like, I didn't come here for this. I came to code. You know, like, oh good. <laughs> That'll get you through several of your first days at the job. And then as soon as like some decisions have to be made, there's more to it. Like it is rare we're talking about feedback this morning and so forth, like, it is rare that there are right answers. And so it's most often the case that there are discussions and leading to agreements, compromises, yeah. collaborations, uh, etc. Well, it, it feels unfair that your voice doesn't get heard for free. It feels bad to have to do that work to get your voice heard. But that's a thing that you have to do. You have to build that credibility. Well, it's like the engineer's fallacy, right, of, like, if you build a good thing, everyone will recognize it. If you build a good thing, customers will just come to it. Yeah. And many of you will find out one time. You will band together with some of your friends and be like, we can do this. And then you'll build a thing and you'll be like, oh shit, no one cares. No one cares. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out I should have done the copy with that salesperson. Maybe like I could have learned how to do this. Right? How to talk to customers, customers and find those things out before I write millions of lines of code. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, I hope this doesn't get too personal, but. Uh, <laughs> building like a uh, medical record system and then getting to the point where it turns out the people in the medical offices would rather use paper than the system that the company built. You know, and it's like, damn, there is a big miss in here. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't Nick's fault, that was before Nick's time. Okay? Nick tried to clean the mess up. Questions in the Hi, uh, Nick here. Um, this may be a silly question. Uh, I've always heard it referred to as the Eiffel Tower. Is it really the Eiffel Tower? Nope, it is the Eiffel Tower in, in English. But the man who built it is Gustav Eiffel. It's American imperialism yep. right there. <laughs> We're like, we won't even use the correct name. Uh, I'm Ellen. Um, my first question, so you don't speak French? No. OK, it sounded really legit to me, so. Katrina, how was it? <laughs> you're, you're the judge. You actually speak French. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take I'll take that as a compliment from Katrina. Uh, well, good job. Thank the, you. My real question is: Can you talk more about the shit umbrella that mm -hmm. you refer to, and like, how much as a employee should you be able to expect, or should you push for from your manager in terms of like transparency? And then, is there ever like a line as a manager that like sharing too much? <laughs> Um, or like sharing too much that's unproductive in a way? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's definitely a line where you're moving beyond a helpful amount of information and into a randomizing amount of information. So the feedback that comes from, as a, as a manager, the feedback that comes from over your head in an organization will often go back and forth. It's just like the thought processes that happen in your brain as your brain tries to make a decision. You'll lean one way, then you'll lead another direction, then you'll lean another direction, and finally a decision will come to be made. Well, if I, as a manager, am passing on all of these vacillations back and forth, my team is going to change directions every time I share one of those. And so doing that in a heat shieldy way is letting them know that this conversation is happening and that the organization is trying to make a decision. We don't have one yet, but these are the two directions that you can kind of start thinking to be prepared for what we might do next. Doing it in a shit umbrella way is to not say anything until the decision is made and just completely block that information. Because you want the people, as a leader, you want the people on your team to be thinking about those things. You want them to be thinking about what's next before you get there. Now, as, as someone who's wanting to give feedback to a manager, um, you should make sure that you're hearing things that are going on in the broader organization. And if you're not, you should just ask general, broad questions about, so what's going on over your head? What, what are the things that the organization is considering right now? Um, Another really effective technique that I personally, as a manager, really enjoy is when one of, my, one of the people on my team comes to me and says, 
here's what I'm seeing and here's my read on this situation. How accurate am I? And that, that's always really fun for me because sometimes they've seen things and spotted patterns that I haven't even put together yet. One of my, uh, or like two, two questions I use for myself to figure out like, what do you, what do you umbrella, what do you shield and what do you pass through are, um, how directly does it affect you as, as the person on my team? Like, are you directly affected? And can you directly affect it? And because if you are not affected and you can't affect it, that I'm just sharing my anxieties with you, right? And that does you no good. It like inhibits your ability to do other work. If you're affected, but you can't affect it, then I have to decide like what's the degree of risk and you're probably better off still not knowing about it. Does that make sense? Like uh, if it's gonna, it's gonna hurt or it's gonna change your work, but you can't do anything about it, then there's really no point. It's, it's like to me a little bit of weakness to say like, Oh, have some of my problems. You can't do yeah. anything about it. Uh, but if you can do something about it, then to be more closer to transparent or, or like some past degree of pass through so that you can start thinking about. And really, I think your point was really important there about being under the shit umbrella can be comforting in that I get to just do the thing I signed up for. But long term, it, it is like stunting your growth, right? Because if you want to be, uh, like, I know you're going to be like many people's boss someday. So, uh, but like, if you're just shielded from all that all the time, it's not allowing you to grow those muscles, right? To get back to like Kiwi, you can't just like snap in to high performance in a thing if those skills have like atrophied or never developed in the first place, right? So, by letting people bear some of that load when appropriate, it's essentially like training you, on ramping you to then be the next team lead. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. And by the way, your French was perfect. I speak French too. Ah. <laughs> um, I have two questions. The first one, um, one thing that really resonated with me from your talk is how much pushback he got. Like when those 300 people like made a commission and all. And I wonder if you could talk a bit to that and what are the parallels in our world. Like when you do something that is really different or that really challenges the status quo, maybe the amount of pushback that you get is a sign that you're onto something. And if the current like structural, uh, the structures we have in our organizations actually allow for people to take on this kind of projects. Um, yeah, and actually those were the two questions because I think like it was beautiful that you shared the drawing that your son did and how sometimes this kind of new projects or like really meaningful creations can resonate with people from around the world and how we can learn from young people to recognize the beauty in that. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's the part that really, really made me question is like, are we pushing the envelope not only in terms of dealing with organizations' politics, but also in terms of things we do and how big we think? Thanks. That's a great question. I think one of the things you have to keep in mind is that as humans, we are generally wired to be afraid of change, in general, of any kind. We don't like change. And we haven't been working in organizations very long as, as a species. We have been banding together in businesses and doing things together for very long. And so organizations take on some of the same thought patterns that happen inside our heads. So organizations generally are built to be afraid of change as well. Um, so no matter what you're proposing, you're going to get some pushback. Um, I think you're right that you can sometimes judge how interesting an idea, and if you're onto something, by how much pushback you get. Uh, other times, you can judge that you're really not onto something, and that pursuing that path is really not good. And there's not an easy way to know that. I don't think. I, I think it's a matter of knowing the people that are giving feedback to you having trusted people that can hear your ideas and tell you when you're onto something and when you probably are not onto something and should probably not pursue something. Um, if you're in a, in a spot in an organization where you can trust your leaders, they can give very good feedback on that because they've often been there longer than you have and they understand the cultural patterns of your organization in ways that you don't understand yet. So they can tell you, oh yeah, we, we tried something like that three years before you joined and here's how it happened and it didn't go very well. Here's why we didn't keep doing it. It might be worth trying it again, but you should you should make it different in this way or this way. So I think it's it's a lot about just finding trusted people to let those ideas with. 
when you talk about Dale Carnegie and so forth, I think um, people can take very shallow um, synopses of some of those ideas, right? Of like, oh, if I say people's name a lot, they'll like me and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's somewhat true, but as you're saying here, understanding someone else's burden is an exceptional way to like build fraternity collaboration with them, right? And when you can come to your boss and it's like, here's this thing I'm noticing, as you said, or I'm wondering about this thing, like, is this a problem? You know, is this a problem we've been dealing with for three years, or have we ever tried to attack this problem? All of a sudden, the, uh, someone willing to like bear some of my load, bear a little bit of my anxiety in a collaborative, contributing way, I'm more than happy to like welcome you in and be like, I've been thinking of everything I could possibly do, or everything we might be ready to do, or able to do, or have the resources to do. And if you're willing to help brainstorm on this problem, like, let's go. You know, and congratulations, you're now in charge of whatever I think. So, Hi, I'm DJ. And thanks for the talk. Um, I don't have a question. I would like to hear your comments on compromise in software. Something, I've seen this kind of thing happen a lot in my organization. The biggest difference is that the thing that we end up building would not last 120 years. Because that is a compromise we often have to give up, is we got to do this fast, we can't do it to the quality and longevity that we like. So how do you think that that like, compromise happens in a good way? So one of these days, I'm going to do a talk about economics aimed at exactly this, because I, I think ultimately it's an economic question. You have to understand that when, when a company hires one of us as a software engineer, they're, they are hiring us, but they're also paying our salary for software that we will build for them. So they're, in, in essence, buying some kind of product. And the company has to decide what it wants to get out of its investment. Does it need software that's going to last 129 years? Probably not. Does it need software that we're going to outgrow in six months? Maybe, if it's an MVP that we're just going to put in front of customers to see if they'll even buy the thing? Sure. As long as we have the agreement up front that, okay, once we prove this out, we know this is the thing that we actually want to do, we're going to rebuild this the right way and not throw it together real quick just as a prototype. So I think, ultimately, it's a question of how long does it need to last? How resilient does it need to be? What number of users does it need to support now? six months, a year from now. Beyond that, you're getting into crystal ball territory and you really can't figure that out anyway. One of the things Sandy Metz says in Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby is that you should focus on making your software easy to change because that will, that will make it more robust over time because as you learn things, as you get feedback from customers, as you understand more about how resilient it needs to be, you'll have ways to mold and modify the software that will make it fit the purpose you needed to fit at that point that you didn't know when you started building. I have a hypothesis. Uh, Marty was talking about the difference between like junior to mid-level and senior level people. I have a hypothesis that um, moving from junior to mid is when you can start to anticipate and correctly predict the ways that the technical problem will change. And from mid to senior is when you can anticipate the way the business problem will change, right? In the like domain of yeah. what, everything you're trying to do. To your point here, right, like we have to build a lot of strip malls before we build monuments. You know, and I think in a danger in a way, like as you as we're saying the same challenges of hopping team to team or company to company or whatnot, it's also easy to get to a spot where you're like, I have five years of experience. Marty told me once I'm in the top half of experience in the industry. And so I'm entitled to certain things, right? And in most industries, if you go like, I have five years experience, they're like, oh, you're like an intern. That's cool. <laughs> you know, and I think we can get confused by the fact that five years in, maybe I get paid $130,000 or whatever, means I'm fancy, right? It's like, ah, you haven't really proven that much, even if some potentially ill-advised people are willing to like, throw you a lot of money. Well, and the other, the other thing about that, <laughs> is the average tenure of a software developer in an organization is 18 months right now. So most of us have 18 month chunks of experience maintaining any given system. We don't have a long, longitudinal experience running something for five years and wrestling with the system and watching it evolve over time. 
And so, in some ways, because we move around so often, we're losing that expertise as an industry. And it's, I, I don't know how to solve that problem. I see the effects of it, but I don't know how to solve it. Stay good. <laughs> 10 years. Like 10 years. 10 years is probably too much. Yeah, I think the right amount of time is like around four, five, six, somewhere. It's like you probably have learned a lot of the things that they're also learning. They're like you're closing in that 80, 85% of what you can get out of it. And then it's interesting the people, the only people I know who have been at a software company doing a software job for more than 10 years are scared to leave because they don't think anybody will want them. Yeah. So like, I only know one thing. Right. Super interesting. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having me.